We can go ahead and have a seat and open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, uh, chapter 8. We're going to be in Luke 8 today as we continue in studying God's words. Um, If you do not have a Bible, we invite you to grab one of the Bibles in the chairs in front of you. You can go to page 1029 as uh, you use that. Uh, And it is good to be here with you guys. I just spent the last week uh, with Pastor Sean, our student pastor up at camp. Uh, So I was with a bunch of junior hires for a week in the mountains of Prescott which brings some good and some bad with it. Um, So I'm up there, got to see God do some amazing things in the lives of our students. Uh, Got to be up there and uh, again, worshiping God in the morning and the evening with a bunch of campers. Also, did I mention the highs were like 85 degrees uh, all week long? It was a little bit of a rude awakening last night when we got back to to Havasu. Um, The bad though with that is I was with a bunch of junior hires all week and sleeping in a camp bed and eating camp food. So, you know, there's some good with some bad with that, which kind of makes me think of the age-old question, I have good news and I have bad news, which would you like first, right? We've all been asked that question before, and I'm curious to do a little survey here. How many of you are a bad news first kind of person? Like, give me the bad, okay, okay. Now, how many of you are the, I want the good news first, the bad news second, and I think there's some people not voting because they can't decide which one they want first. So, I'm a, I'm a bad news first kind of guy with, uh, you know, if, if there's a situation, I'm like, hey, give me the bad news. What's going on? Uh, I want to hear that. Uh, I'm also that way with my food. Like, I'm going to eat the stuff I don't like, the vegetables, the mediocre tasting food. I'm going to eat that first and, like, end with the good stuff that I actually enjoy. But, but beyond just saying, hey, are we good news or bad news first, I want you to think a little bit today, how do you respond to bad news? Not just what order do you want it in, but how do you respond to it? Because all of us respond to bad news differently, and the truth is that all of us will receive bad news, uh, hopefully less frequently than we want, but we don't get to control that. So all of us receive it. How do you respond? Do you get angry? Do you cry? Do you shut down? Do you want to fix it? Do you want to ignore it? Do you want to pretend it's not real? How do you respond to bad news? Because see, if we, if we look at our life and see the bad news that comes, we have to think about how do we, how do we process that? How do we respond to it? See, I'm a, I'm a fix it kind of response. I'm like, okay, give me the bad news and let me analyze it as quickly and accurately as possible. Come up with a plan to fix it and just make it go away. That's how I respond to bad news. But it doesn't always work that way. There's plenty of situations that there's bad news and there's no solution to it. There's no easy fix. There's no, hey, here's two steps and everything gets better and the bad news goes away. And add to that, there's seasons of life where it seems like there is no good news second. It's just bad news part two, part three, part four. And, and when you look at our world, there's seasons where bad news seems to dominate the storyline. And, and in some ways, it kind of feels like we're living in that season right now. Because on the, the kind of the big scale, you've got, you've got the, the ongoing tension internationally. You've got Ukraine, you've got Texas, you've got Buffalo, you've got the economy, you've got all the bad news around us in the big scale. But on our, our own individual lives, you've got that as well. Because we've got health diagnoses, you've got job loss, you've got gas prices increasing, you've got divorce news and so on and so forth. And what can happen sometimes is when we're in those seasons of bad news part one, bad news part three, bad news part four, is it can cause us to question where we get hope for the coming days. And the good news is that when we look at scripture, we see the ultimate source of good news. And today we're gonna look at a story where there's a couple of individuals who were living in a state of despair. Their hope for tomorrow had run out because of the bad news they were living in. But they encountered Jesus and that pivoted. And so we want to look at this. It's going to be a longer passage. So I really do uh, invite you to, to join in it uh, so you can follow along. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. I want to read this whole passage um, so we can kind of get a, a picture of what happened as a whole and then come back and talk about uh, what that means for us. So Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40, it says this. It says, now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him and they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed in around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. 
She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And the woman saw that she was not hidden. She came trembling and falling before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had immediately been healed. And Jesus said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Verse 49, while they were still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, upon hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, child, arise, and her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her, to her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, this is an incredible series of events, an incredible series of interruptions in escalating bad news. But what I want to do is say, hey, what is the hope that these individuals found and what difference does that have for our life today? And see, the first thing that we see here is that desperation led them to Jesus. For both the woman and for Jairus, their desperation led them to Jesus. See, for, for Jairus, you see that, that he's pleading with Jesus to heal his daughter. He, we don't know the nature of the illness, but you know, we're told from the very beginning, she is dying. It's not looking good. And, and presumably, they had tried everything. They had gone, I'm sure, to doctors and all kinds of treatments. If they had essential oils, they were putting them behind the ears and under the feet. Like, they were trying everything here. But she, she wasn't getting better. And there's Jairus, her father, there with the understanding that either Jesus would act or she would die. There's desperation that leads him to that place. For the woman, we're given a little bit more information. We are told for 12 years she had been bleeding. For 12 years, it said she had spent everything she made on doctors and physicians and treatments, and nothing worked. For 12 years, she had suffered. For 12 years, she had gone, hey, wh how can I fix this? And nothing had worked. And in desperation, she found herself there at the feet of Jesus. She, she's there saying, hey, the only thing that can help me is a miraculous healing from Jesus. But there's also faith involved because she says, hey, all I have to do, I think, is just touch the garment of, uh, of Jesus and I will be healed. See, the, the desperation took them to Jesus. They couldn't do anything to fix their situation. They couldn't find anyone to help them. They couldn't uh, find other options or solutions to their situations which I think for us brings up a good question of when, when we are desperate, when our options seem slim, when we don't know where to turn, where do we go? How do we respond in those times of desperation? Because if we're honest, there's a lot of unhealthy destinations we can run to in those points. There's, there's chemical destinations of, of drinking or drugs that promise an escape, promise to numb the pain, promise to, to give us a way out of the hurt that we're feeling. There's, there's escape mechanisms. We can binge on TV or Netflix. We can scroll endlessly on social media. We can pretend that it doesn't escape and just try and escape the world that we're living in. There's also the socially acceptable things. We can overeat, we can overwork, we can overschedule our life so that we don't have the time to think about the pain that's around us. So where do you run when you're desperate? When, when things are not looking good, when there's an endless list of bad news, where does that take you? Because I think it's, it's easier than we'd like to admit to run to some of those unhealthy destinations. But for both of these people here that we see in this passage here in, in the book of Luke, they chose a different option. They chose to run to something productive, run to something that, that promised hope and healing, and that's exactly what they got. Because see, their decision to run to Jesus resulted in something that changed their life. 
And that's the good news that we get to look at today is that Jesus brings hope and healing. For both of these individuals coming from very different situations, from very different places of bad news, they both received hope and healing from Jesus. In a situation that was chaotic and, and crazy, there's crowds pressing in on Jesus. He's trying to get somewhere. Everyone's trying to get his attention. Jairus is at his feet pleading, hey, Jesus, pay attention to me. My daughter's dying. And then he's getting interrupted by this woman who's, who's just trying to, to sneak in and sneak out. And everything seems crazy. And then Jesus stops everything. And he goes, wait, who, who did that? Who touched me? And Peter being the talk first, think second guy that Peter is, uh, goes, Jesus, everyone's touching you. Like, come on, let's, let's just keep moving here. But Jesus paused, he stopped the situation, he delayed the moment to, to identify the woman. And I think he did this so that she would both experience the healing that she already had, but also the hope that could come from Jesus. See, she wanted to get in and get out anonymously and just move on, but Jesus wanted to identify her. And I think first he wanted to restore her, her dignity and self-worth. See, the issue that she had, the medical condition she was suffering with meant that she would be ceremoniously unclean in Jewish law, which meant because she had the, this issue of bleeding, she couldn't go to worship she couldn't go to certain uh, social gatherings. She would be an outcast. She would be excluded and unable to participate with the people that she knew for 12 years. And even in this moment, she experiences healing, but she's wanting to do what she had done for the last 12 years and just kind of sneak in and sneak out because that's all she was allowed to do under their cultural laws. And Jesus stopped and said, no, 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 no. I, 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 there's more here. And, and he calls out to her, he identifies her, she, she confesses what had happened and proclaimed the goodness of the healing. And Jesus greets her and he calls her daughter, which I think is just so powerful, communicates the compassion, the love, the, 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 the connectedness that Jesus was saying, hey, you have hope here. You have, you have value, you have worth even though the world for the last 12 years has, has pushed you aside, I'm welcoming you. I'm giving you an identity, a value, a worth as an individual. But secondly, I think he's wanting to specifically identify the source of the healing. See, it would have been so easy for the people that knew about this, maybe even for the woman herself to think, well, maybe it wasn't Jesus. Maybe he's just got like the most magical robe that's ever existed. And if, and if anyone just touches the robe, that does everything. But Jesus goes, no, it's not about the robe. Verse 48, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He didn't say, hey, my robe has made you well. Go in peace, enjoy your life. He said, no, 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 your faith has made you well. He's saying, your faith in me, your faith that I am the son of God and have power to change your life is what has done this. Because of your faith, you are made well. But see, Jesus delaying this, it, it, it adds value, it adds hope and purpose to this woman, but it seemingly does the opposite for Jairus because he's pleading, the situation is urgent. Jesus, you need to go to my house. We need to go. Let's go now. He's at Jesus' feet at the beginning of the story. And Jesus is doing this whole sidebar thing over here, and you can't help but think Jairus is like, come on, let's go. Let's go. We don't have time. And he was right because the servant comes up and says, hey, your, your daughter has died. It, it, don't bother the teacher anymore. Let's, let's go home. And for Jarius, he probably just felt the, the life come out of him. He's, he's hopeless now more than ever. But Jesus speaks in response. He says, do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. See, as we heard, he goes to their house, he goes in and he just tells her to get up and she does and then tells the parents to give her some foods. And what's interesting is G Jarius experienced a bigger miracle than what he was asking for. He went to Jesus that day saying, hey, heal sickness from my daughter's life. And he experienced a delay, he experienced the grief of that. But the result is that he experienced a much bigger blessing 
he got to see a resurrection happen in his own home for his own daughter. Which is interesting because we often get so bent out of shape when what we want doesn't happen when we want it. See, we never see that as a good thing. And Jerry, as I'm sure, for the entire time walking back to the house was not seeing this as a good thing. He was not seeing it as a good thing that this woman, whatever her name was, interrupted and threw off all of his plans. And if she wasn't there, he could have gotten Jesus to the house sooner. And he experienced something incredible as a result. See, the, the bigger thing, though, is that for both of these individuals... For the woman and for Jairus, it was highlighted their faith, their belief in Jesus is what allowed this to happen. Their, their faith and belief in Jesus as the son of God who could do anything is what allowed these miracles to happen. It wasn't their, their positive energy, their good thinking for the woman. It wasn't her you know, clean eating and healthy life choices that allowed this to happen, but it was her faith. And I think that's important because we live in a world that highlights positivity, that highlights good thinking, that highlights good vibes and, and good life choices as the means to get the hope that we're looking for. We're, we're told that to dream big dreams and to think good thoughts if bad news is coming our way. But see, the truth is that if hope is coming from within us, we're never gonna find what we're looking for. The only hope that we can have for our life, for our world, is found in faith in Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world. If we're looking for hope in, in the, the moment of bad news, if we're looking for hope for our world, for our life, we're never going to find it in just dreaming big dreams and manifesting good things in our life in spreading good vibes and positive thinking. It's only found in trusting in Jesus as our Savior and, and going to him and laying everything down and saying, Jesus, I trust you, I'm following you. And the truth that we need to sink in is that our hope for every situation should be founded in Jesus. Because when, when we find ourselves in a situation that, that, that we can't do anything, in a situation uh, where we can't solve the problem in the face of something impossible, we know that all of that is possible for Jesus. Where, where our abilities run out is where Jesus' power begins. See, for, for these people, no doctor could heal this woman for 12 years, and Jesus, not even looking at her, not even interacting with her, miraculously heals her in an instant. No doctor could heal Jairus' daughter. I'm sure they tried. They did everything, I'm sure. And when everything ran out, Jesus spoke, and she woke up from the dead and came back to life. Where things seem impossible is where the possible begins with God. So today, if you believe that Jesus can bring hope and healing and power into your life, are you living that way? Are you living like you believe that Jesus is God and can do anything in your life? Or are you trying to still be in control of your situation and fix your problems and, and be the solution to the impossible in your life? Are you trying to manufacture your own hope or are you trusting in the hope of Jesus as your savior? Because the good news is that when we say, hey, God, I trust you, I believe in you, we see the impossible become possible in our life. And Jesus brings hope, he brings healing, he brings change into our life. And that's the good news that we see from this story. But see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get those of you who like the bad news first and good news second, because as we look at this, there's a couple points of not so great news that we have to acknowledge just looking at this story and how it relates to us. And the first is that faith in Jesus is unpopular. And, and, and I'm reading in between the lines a little bit with these two individuals, uh, so follow along with me in this. But when you look at both of them, their journey to, to seeing God work in their life was a difficult one. See, for the woman, she had to press through the crowd, a crowd that was, was so dense. Earlier in Luke 8, verse 19, it says that Jesus' own mom and brothers couldn't get through the crowds to him. She's having to fight through the crowds and get to Jesus. She's having to, to overcome the, the shame and embarrassment of her situation. She's having to, to overcome the stigma and, and, and cultural uh, stuff that was attached to what was going on and, and overcome all that. But in her belief, she acted and went to Jesus. But especially for, for Jairus, we see the, the unpopularity of his faith. 
He also had the crowd and the, and the, the difficulty of, of getting to Jesus and getting his attention. And on top of that, this random lady interrupting his plans. But then as they're talking, again, we see the messenger. The messenger comes and tells Jairus, your, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher any longer, it says. And I find this so interesting because it wasn't just an update. It was an update with a commentary. It says, don't bother the teacher any longer. The implication is if Jesus could help previously, this just went above his pay grade. The implication from the messenger is if Jesus would have been able to help previously, there's no way he can help now, so let's just pack it up and go home. They're saying, don't bother with Jesus. He can't help is the implication of that. Then the, Jesus gets to the house and, and Jesus walks in and, and, and that day when someone died, people would come to the house, the family, friends, the community would come and spend time at the house mourning and it was an event. You didn't grieve by yourself. You grieved in community, which is actually a really cool thing, but, but everyone is already there mourning and grieving for this 12-year-old girl that has died. And it says, Jesus got there and said, hey guys, she's just asleep. And they laugh. And not like a sarcastic, hey, you're kind of a funny guy laugh. There's an implication there that they laugh like the fact that Jesus could do something was comical to them. Like, why are you even here? Why are you saying that, Jesus? You can't do anything. See, for both of them, they had to overcome the, the obstacles, the unpopularity, the resistance from the, the world around them getting to Jesus and, and getting to him working in their life. And see, for us, what we have to understand is that the world is not going to reinforce our decision to trust and follow Jesus. It is never going to celebrate that and embrace that. The only place that we find celebration and reinforcement of that is in a community of faith But see, practically, when you look at our our life, we'll have people and things and schedules and and, and seemingly important commitments that surround us like a crowd and, and, and try and keep us further from Jesus. When you look at our life, we'll have people tell us not to bother with Jesus because he can't help us. There's nothing he can do. Why are you bothering with that religion thing? We'll have people laugh and mock the fact that we believe that Jesus is real and can work in our life. I believe that in the not so distant future, we'll start to experience real and tangible persecution in our country for believing and following in Jesus and for believing that the Bible is true and accurate and should be our, our guideline for life. The world is not going to reinforce our decision to follow Jesus, but we can't let that prevent us from following him. And in fact, in those moments where it's unpopular, that should fuel us to lean into Jesus even more. The more unpopular it is in the moment, the more we should lean in and say, hey, Jesus, I'm gonna trust in you and not what the crowd around me is trying to get me to believe. I'm gonna trust in your word, not what our culture says is real. I'm gonna trust in you, not in anything tangible in this world. See, that first thing is that that faith in Jesus is unpopular, but the second not so great piece of news we have to hear today is that God doesn't always work when or how we want. I can't help but notice the the timeline for both of these individuals. The woman for 12 years was dealing with this issue. For 12 years, you've gotta imagine she was praying, she was pleading with God, God, please take this away, heal me, get me better, and yet for 624 weeks, she suffered. For, for Jairus, we don't know exactly how long his daughter was ill, but, but you get the idea that, that there's, there's a difference in what his preferred timeline was and what actually happened. She's sick, she's nearing death. He's gotta be praying, hey God, please fix this, please fix this, please heal her. And then he's before Jesus and he's like, okay, if I can just get him there quickly, he can heal her. And she dies and you gotta think the whole way there He's saying those, those why and what if questions that we say when someone dies. Why did this happen? Why does it have to be this way? What if I could have done this? What if, what if I said this instead? And then you, you zoom out even more and you look at the fact that there is a literal crowd around Jesus and he helps exactly two people that day. 
There's got to be dozens of people that were there pleading for a miracle, pleading for healing, pleading for Jesus to do something. And yet those people went home that day with, with no healing, with no miracle taking place in their life. And when you look at this, it, it makes you ask why, you know, why does God do things the way he does? And, and the truth is that, that God's plans will always be a mystery until we get to talk to him face to face. We can never systemize or explain or, or fit God's plans and methods into our uh, idea of how life should work. It's never going to, to fit our description, our ideas, our goals for life. But what we must do is be willing to fall at the feet of Jesus and say, Jesus, you are enough. You are good. You are all I need. I don't need my outcome for life to happen in order for my life to be complete. And we also must be willing to say, I don't need my desires to come true in order for you to be good. Because see, the, the cross, the event of Jesus going to the cross is what proves that God is good, not him fulfilling our wish list for our life when we want it to happen. Jesus dying on the cross to pay for the sins of people who were his enemies are what proves he is good. Jesus dying for the people who didn't deserve it proves he is good. And the, the way that we know God is worth worshiping is because of that. That's the reason that we know God can be our source of hope and help in our life is because of the cross, not because of our timeline being met the way we want. So today, as you look at your life, as you process bad news, as you process curveballs and unexpected events, where are you going to turn? What, what are you going to cling to? Where are you going to, to go when you face those moments of being hopeless and broken and overwhelmed? Because the truth is that only in Jesus can we find hope and healing for our life. Only in Jesus can we find the hope that we're looking for that the world can't provide. And so today I hope and I pray that you would turn to Jesus, that you would fall at his feet and say, Jesus, you are good and I wanna follow you. Jesus, you are good, I wanna give you control of my life and I trust you to work through these places of brokenness, of despair, of hurt, because I know that where I cannot do anything, God, you can do everything. And that's my hope and prayer for us as a community that we would pursue Jesus and trust in him for our hope and nothing else. Let's pray here today. God, I thank you that you are good, that, that you work in our world even, even in ways that we don't understand, in ways that we don't see in the moment. God, but what's so good is that we get to look back. We get to see evidence of how you have worked in our life as we sang just a few moments ago. God, we get to see the proof that you are powerful, you are good because of how you change our life. So God, as we face bad news, as we face moments of despair and brokenness and pain, remind us of the ways that you have worked in our life. Remind us of the ways that you are good, the ways that you can, can do what seems impossible, the ways that you can redeem situations that feel hopeless. And God, let us trust you and worship you. Let us not lean on our own understanding, but God, help us to trust and follow you so that we can worship you on the other side of the pain and brokenness that we experience in life. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.